Now, as we come here to 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, we've come to the last chapter of the book. And actually, this is a chapter that we have labeled in our notes, the Christian's actions in view of the return of Christ. Chapter 1, you'll recall, was the Christian's attitude toward the return of Christ. Now, if that attitude does not lead to actions, then something is radically wrong. And here we have the actions. And the coming of Christ, we see here, is a rousing hope. It leads to action. It alerts us. And in the first ten verses, there is a call here to you and me to be awake and alert in view of Christ's coming. And I think the reason that he gives here It's because the believer will not enter into that awful night of the great tribulation period that is labeled the day of the Lord. That is, as we've said time and time again, the day of the Lord begins with night because that was God's way of marking time. On the first day, the second day of creation, it was the evening and the morning were the first day. And God begins in night, but moves to light. And we will find that is true. The great tribulation leads then to the glorious millennial reign of Christ, when the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Now, the day of the Lord is an expression that we need to look at here. Therefore, let me read the first two verses. He says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Now, the times and seasons. Now, this is not the property of the church. Times and seasons belong to this earth and belong to an earthly people, both Israel and the Gentiles that will be saved in that day. And the word, by the way, for time here is actually chronos. We get our word chronology from it. And what we have here is this expression, the times and the seasons. Now, we do not, I think, deal with that at all. He says, we have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, the Lord Jesus does not come to the church like a thief in the night, because a thief is not welcome. You're not looking for him. He generally comes unexpectedly, and he certainly does not receive a welcome. When you leave home, you just don't put a note on the back door that says, I've left the back door open, Mr. Thief, And you'll find the family silver in the third drawer to the right in the dining room and help yourself. I don't imagine that you ever do that at all. Chances are when you leave home, you double lock everything. You want to keep a thief out. So he comes as a thief to this earth, the Lord Jesus does. And the day of the Lord will come like that suddenly to the earth. And it's going to come at a time when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Do you notice the change of pronoun here? The first two verses, he speaks of the fact that we have nothing to do with times and seasons. not necessary for him to write to us of that, because... The day of the Lord's going to come to this earth as a thief in the night. They won't be looking for it at all. And he says, yourselves, ye have no need that I write to you. But now, when he begins to talk about the times of the day of the Lord, verse 3, when they shall say peace and safety. Paul is saying that believers just won't be here when that time comes At all. And I think that's very important to see. Now, again, may I repeat that the day of the Lord is a period of time that begins with the great tribulation, 
and it goes through the millennial reign of Christ here upon the earth. Now, there are many passages of Scripture that speak of that. For instance, over in the second chapter of Isaiah, and we were in Isaiah some time ago, you'll remember. God says, verse 12 of chapter 2, "...for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that's proud and lofty, and upon every one that's lifted up, and shall be brought low." And he moves down through that section that there'll be a judgment on society and government and upon the military, upon commerce and art and pomp and pride and religion. All of that, you see. And if you turn over a few pages in Isaiah, and you'll recall when we were studying that some time ago, that we looked at this in Isaiah 13, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. And he goes on to speak of the frightful things that shall come. And in the prophecy of Joel, which we have not yet come to, we are told in chapter 1, verse 15, "...alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is at hand." And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And he speaks of it as a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Now, that's the picture of it in the Old Testament. Now, the day of the Lord begins with the great tribulation, and it goes through the millennial reign. And that is a theme in the Old Testament. Now, what we had in chapter 4 the coming of Christ to take the church out of the world. Friends, that's not even mentioned in the Old Testament. It's there by type, of course. You see it in the type of Enoch and Elijah. And you see other types, but it's not taught in the Old Testament that the Lord Jesus was going to take a company of people out of this earth to be with himself. What a glorious, wonderful truth That is, and that is the truth that was revealed first in the upper room when the Lord Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Now, as far as I know, that's the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. And now Paul develops it in the fourth chapter, as we've seen the last two times. But now... He's talking about something that is the theme of the Old Testament, and it was well known in the Old Testament. Now, he moves on from that, and he says that it'll be a time that's going to be a big surprise to the world. they sure not going to expect it. They are not looking for it at all. And he goes on to say here, when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Now, I believe the big lie that we'll see in Second Thessalonians, and the Lord Jesus warned of that, take heed that no man deceive you, because of the fact that the world will think they're entering the millennium, a great era of peace, and actually they're entering the great tribulation period. It's going to come upon them suddenly, like a thief in the night. Now he says, "...but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as the thief. Ye are the children of light." Now, the rapture of the church actually does two things. It ends this day of grace that we're in, the calling out of the church, a body, a bringing many sons home to glory. That's what God's doing today. Now, the rapture will end that, but it not only ends that, it begins the day of the Lord. The great tribulation will get underway when the church leaves the earth. Now, what is the relationship, then, has the coming of Christ for his church to the day of the Lord? Well, he goes on to say, the times and seasons I don't need, he says, to talk to you about. You know perfectly, says the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief. It's taught back in the Old Testament. You know about that. 
now it's coming suddenly. And they think that it's going to be a time of peace, but it's going to be the greatest war the world's ever seen. Now it's a day of wrath. My, the different ways that it is described. Now, the question is still, how does the coming of Christ for his church, how does that relate to the day of the Lord, which precedes the second coming of Christ? How is that related? The point, I think, is just simply this, that at the translation of the church, the end of the day of grace has come, and now we begin the day of the Lord. And in other words, the one event does two things. It closes one day, it opens another. And that day opens in darkness as the day begins. But we're not in darkness, he says. Now, why are we not in darkness? And the day won't overtake us as a thief. Why? We won't be here, friends. We went out, as we found in the last chapter. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven and take his church out of the world. Now, he says, you're children of the light. You don't belong to that dispensation that's coming. You belong to the dispensation of grace that we're in today. And friends, until you learn to make these distinctions in Scripture, you're going to be hopelessly confused. And very candidly, I know of no one so hopelessly confused as some theologians in seminaries today. I've talked to them. One man said he just gave up on prophecy, had nothing to do with it. Why? Well, because he's not willing really to study. And what we have here, when the day of the Lord comes, we're going to be with the Lord. We're not in darkness, he says. Makes that clear. That day should overtake you as a thief, because he's not coming as a thief to the church. We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Now, he says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others. You see, the blessed hope, that is, the rapture of the church could take place at any time. In view of that, we ought not to be sleeping Christians. I heard a song leader down in Georgia, and in his very quaint way, He uttered a great many wise things, and I wish all song leaders could do that instead of some of them make such asinine statements that are as unbiblical as anything can be. But this boy was right on target. He said, friends, we're going to sing Standing on the Promises. Now, he says there are a lot of folk today that are singing Standing on the Promises, and they're sitting on the premises. Well... And some of them actually are sleeping pillars in the church. Now, what Paul is saying here, in view of the fact that the Lord Jesus is going to take his church out of the world, we won't be here, and the world's going to, those that are not saved are going to enter this awful period. He says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And this business of being sober here, friends, has several meanings. It means not only sober in the sense that you're not using an alcoholic stimulant, but you know a lot of people get drunk on power, on the making of money, on the pleasures of this world. There are a lot of things that you can get drunk on today and get carried away. You know, a lot of people get high today on many things. Now, he says to the child of God, let's us be sober. And let us watch. Why? Because of these tremendous events that are going to take place in the future. And friends, we may be close to them. I don't know. I think we are, but I don't know that. I believe it with all my heart. And in my judgment, I think the coming of Christ draweth nigh. And I know I can say with Scripture, our redemption is nearer than when we first believed. Now we're not to sleep as Others do the rest that are around us. Let's watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Now, the whole thought here, the children of light just can't engage in this type of thing. They're to live for God today. Now he says, but let us who are of the day be sober. And again, he mentions that word sober. And that's a 
Very good word. Let's understand here that we have a duty. Now he is going to mention something that he mentions later on in Ephesians, and we've already looked at that. He says here, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, this speaks of soldier service, as you can see. Here is a call to soldier's duty. What are we to do? Put on the breastplate of faith and love. That covers your heart, you know, and the vital parts of your body, the breastplate does. And then the helmet, the hope of salvation. And this is a day when everybody, all men go bareheaded, and women don't wear hats very much today. Every Christian ought to have on a helmet, and that's the hope of salvation. And we have these three words here again. This is the third time they've appeared in this epistle. A labor of love and the work of faith and the patience of hope. Here we have it again. Faith, saving faith, and saving faith produces works. As Calvin put it, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. What a picture we have here. And love, love is for the present. Faith looks back to the past. Love for the present. And that is the relationship the believer should have in those round about him. And the hope of salvation. And that is the blessed hope. That's what he says that the believer's looking for. We're not looking for the day of the Lord. We're not looking for the great tribulation period. I don't see how you could rejoice in that in any way whatsoever. We're looking for a blessed hope. And that is the consummation of our salvation. John says, Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Now, God's not through with me, so don't you be impatient with me. And so the little lady down in Mississippi, I guess maybe this West Texas, years ago, in a testimony meeting, she got up and said, most Christians ought to have written on their back, this is not the best that the grace of God can do. And I always felt that I ought to have that on my back. He's not through with me, and don't you be impatient with me. And by the way, I won't be impatient with you, I hope, because I don't think he's through with you either. And today, there is the hope of salvation. That is, that he will consummate what he's begun with us. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of salvation. Now, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now, that ought to be clear today even to an amillennialist. For some reason, they missed the point. God hasn't appointed us to the day of wrath, to the great tribulation. Church is not going through it. It's a time of judgment. Christ bore our judgment. Somebody says, you think you're good enough to go out. No, I'm not even good enough to be saved. But he did it by grace. And when he comes, takes his church out, I'm going with you super-duper saint. And you know why? Because of the grace of God. He hasn't appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliverance from wrath. And that's what the great tribulation. Who died for us, this is verse 10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. Now, whether you die or whether you live, and that is coming. After all, most of the church has already gone through the doorway of death. And what a parade that's going to be someday, beginning with Stephen and the apostles, and then the martyrs, and then down through the ages. And you and I, if we're alive, we'll bring up the rear. That's all we're going to do. But thank God we're going to be there by the grace of God. Now, what does this do for you? Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. This is a marvelous, wonderful thing. Now, we're going to begin here with verse 11, a series of commandments for believers. I have listed 22 of them here. And you talk about the Ten Commandments. What about the 22 commandments? And here are commandments for believers. And this, I think, will answer the question of whether today when we say you're saved by the grace of God, faith in Christ apart from works, 
that this ought to answer the question for you, that up to the time you save, God has you shut up to a cross. God has the world shut up to the cross, and he's not asking anything of the world except this. Here's this question. What will you do with my son who died for you? Now, after you've answered that question, and if you answered it in the affirmative and accepted him as your Savior, now he's going to talk to you about your life. He's going to develop you, and you should grow in grace in the knowledge of him. And we ought to be a better Christian this year than we were last year. Now, the child of God is not under the Ten Commandments as a way of life. He's way above it. He's to live on a much higher plane. And here are some of these commandments. And they're very practical. Here is where the rubber meets the road, right here. Now, it's a wonderful, glorious thing to keep looking up for the coming of Christ. But it's also very important that we keep walking down here on the sidewalks, not of New York, but on the sidewalks of your town and mine in the home and in the factory, in the office, in the schoolroom, wherever we are called to walk. Here are the things that he tells us that the Lord Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And there are many Christians who haven't even listened to them yet. And here they are. He gives them out actually like military orders are given. They're brief and they're terse. And they're barked out like a second lieutenant had given to it. And there's military terminology here that we are to put on the breastplate of faith and the helmet of the hope of salvation. And now, beginning here in verse 11, he gives the first one. And they come here, it seems to me, in sort of bunches. That is, certain ones are related. We'll call attention to that. Now, in verse 11, we're to encourage one another. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. That's commandment number one. And that means that we're to encourage one another in the faith. And then, two, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, they were doing this in Thessalonica. Edify means to build up one another. You and I should be a team working together. We should be giving out the Word of God. And then he goes on to say, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And that's the third commandment. And then the fourth is verse 13, And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And five, And be at peace among yourselves. Now, these three commandments right here seem to me to belong together. Understand those who teach the Word. And it means that we should recognize them. Now, actually, Paul is speaking into the local situation in Thessalonica. Now, you'll recall he'd been there only just a month, less than a month, of course. And he had taught them, and the church began we would say, from scratch. There wasn't a believer there till Paul arrived, did missionary work. So they've all been saved about the same time. Now, among those, there would be certain ones that would have the gift of teaching. And each believer is given a gift. I think the moment you're saved, those of you that have been with us through 1 Corinthians already know this, that every believer is given a gift and you're to exercise it in the body of believers, to build up the body of believers. Now, there was some there that had the gift of teaching and of preaching and helping them. And I have a notion that the attitude could be like this. Well, so-and-so and I, we were saved at the same time. I knew him when. Where did he get the idea that he can teach me? I was saved same time as he was. We should recognize in the church that certain men and women have certain gifts, and we should respect them. We should look to them. And he says here, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. The problem today is that the average teacher in the church, 
They pay no attention to it. And we've got a great many people say, oh, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. Oh, we believe every word of it. Well, why don't they obey it? Why don't they listen when it's being taught? They don't. And it's almost nonsense today. And it's certainly hypocritical to talk about believing the Bible and then know nothing about it. One man said to me very candidly, he says, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. And he says, and I'm ignorant of what's between the covers. Well, he sure was. (laughs) And the interesting thing is, that's almost an untenable position to hold. I think if you knew what was between the covers, you would believe it. But don't say you believe it and then be ignorant of it because you betray immediately a hypocritical position. If you say you believe this is the Word of God, then this is the thing you should listen to. Therefore, those that are preaching and teaching the Word of God should be listened to. Now he says the fourth commandment, verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. I have always appreciated people today who love the Word of God because I've always found that they become your friends. And I was telling somebody just the other day, one of the things I have so appreciated about this radio ministry are the number of friends that God has raised up to me across this country. Many of them have written and say their home is open to me. Well, I can't accept the invitations. I couldn't get around to all of them. And many of them say, you know, that when I'm in their town, they just do so many things for you. And they reveal a love. And my friend, when they reveal that love to me, because I'm hard to love, it reveals that they honor the Word of God, because they do believe I teach the Word of God, at least I try to. And then the fifth thing, and be at peace among yourselves. Now, all this comes together in one package. You can't have everybody running the church. (laughs) And you can't have everybody running any kind of an organization that's Christian. You just have to have certain ones that are doing it. And I think the great problem in many churches today is that it's the case of the old cliché, the old bromide. Too many cooks spoil the broth. You just need one to be the leader. And he is the one that should be followed. And when you have that, you have peace. But when everybody's trying to play his own little tune, you have anything but harmony and peace. So all of this goes together, you see. Now, verse 14, we have the sixth commandment here. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Now, you see, this would normally follow here. Warn the unruly. And the idea is those that are out of step. Now, there's some people that actually, they really get out of step. My feeling is they're loners. They don't work with the church. They do their own little thing, and they do not support the work of God. Warn them that are unruly, and comfort the feeble-minded. Now, what does he mean by comfort the feeble-minded? Well, what he means is the faint-hearted. He's not talking about those with mental problems. Comfort the faint-hearted. Help them to get in step. There are many people that are fearful to move out for God. And they need encouraging. There's many a saint today that needs somebody to put his arm around him and say to him, Brother, you're going to make it. I'm for you. I'm praying for you. How wonderful it is. That is the most wonderful thing I was introduced in San Diego by a pastor down there. And he says that this man has probably been prayed for more than any other man in the United States. Well, I don't know whether that's true or not, but literally it's now thousands of letters have come to us saying, we prayed for you, prayed for you when you had the cancer spots on your lungs, and we still pray for you. And I certainly need it. May I say to you that we need that, the faint-hearted. Sometimes it's discouraging for all of us. Comfort the faint-hearted and support the weak. Now, there are those that are weak in the faith, and they cannot get in step. They're little babies. They wouldn't be able to march in step. And therefore, help them, lift them up. It's like the story that 
we told about the little girl carrying this big heavy baby. And somebody says, little girl in that baby too heavy for you. And she said, no, he's my brother. <laughs> Makes a lot of difference, you see. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. And that means don't lose your temper. And now he's meddling, if you don't mind me saying that, because it's so difficult today, is it not, to deal either in business or in some public place with some cantankerous, unsaved, unholy, ungodly individual that definitely is trying to trip you or to abuse you in some way. Be patient toward all men. Don't lose your temper. That's what it means. Don't lose your temper. Now, we come to the 10th commandment in verse 15. And he says here, and it's a very wonderful one, "...see that none render evil for evil unto any man." Now, This is something that I think is very important. And in other words, don't fight one another. Don't render evil to any man, but follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Now today, as someone has put it, there are three philosophies of life. First, there is the standard that the pagan has today, this pagan world operates on a philosophy that you do evil in response to good. In other words, you get the uh, other fellow before he gets you. You use any kind of a method. He may have treated you well, but if you can take advantage of him, you do that. That's a pagan heathen philosophy. Then there is the standard of the so-called, I suppose, refined and educated and cultured world, and that is, you do good to those that do good to you. (laughs) Remember the Lord Jesus said, why, all these religious rulers, they always do good to those that do good to him. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party operate on that principle today. Somebody helps you get an office and you help him by maybe giving him an office. You know, you take care of your own. That's the philosophy of this so-called civilized world today. Now, the Christian faith has a little different philosophy. Do good to them that do evil to us. And my friend, that's contrary to the natural man. The minute that somebody hits you, you want to hit him back. You feel like hitting him back. And this is the philosophy that Paul is talking about here, that you are to not render evil to any man, but you to follow that which is good, even to those that do evil to you. And now the twelfth commandment is here in verse 16, and I think that you have three commandments that really go together. I've always felt that these go together here. In verse 16, rejoice evermore, or rejoice always. And it doesn't mean be happy. This is not the happy hour we're talking about. This is to rejoice. And Paul says in Philippians, and that he wrote at the end of his ministry, Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say, rejoice. My, that's a commandment. You don't find that in the Ten Commandments. You have no right, my friend, as a child of God, to go around as a sour puss. You've got no right to go around as a cantankerous individual. You are to rejoice evermore as a child of God. And how wonderful it is to be able to rejoice. And by the way, it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace. And if you can't rejoice right now, then begin reading the Word of God and calling on God to put joy in your heart. He'll do it. Rejoice always. And then, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now, this has to do with an attitude of prayer. That doesn't mean you to stay on your knees all the time, but I think that it means to pray regularly and to be constantly, I think, in the attitude of prayer. And then he goes on and says in verse 18, "...in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you." 
Now, that's to give thanks in all circumstances, not once a year, but all the time. And he says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, if you would come to me and say today, what is the will of God for me? Well, I couldn't really tell you, but I can tell you three things here. That's the will of God for you. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. That's the will of God for us. Now, verse 19, quench not the Spirit. Now, how do you quench the Spirit? Now, that's in verse 19. You see, the Holy Spirit, one of the figures that's used of the Holy Spirit, is fire. And how do you quench a fire? Well, you dampen it down and don't let it burn. To quench the Spirit means that you refuse to do the will of God. That is, you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. You refuse to let the Holy Spirit be the guide and to lead you. You've taken matters in your own hands, and you and I quench the Holy Spirit when we do that. And this, by the way, shows the Holy Spirit actually is a person, because you couldn't quench anything but a person, you know. You couldn't hurt anyone but a person in this connection. The same word that we saw back in Ephesians, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. Grieve, you have to grieve a person, can't grieve a thing, and there it means sin in the life. And here it means to quench not the Spirit, step out of the will of God, and then despise not prophesy. Now, what does he mean by that? That's verse 20. Do not look down upon Bible study as something beneath you. Do not be indifferent to the Word of God. We've got a lot of folk in Christian service that are ignorant of the Bible, and they look down on Bible study. And I hear this every now and then. It generally comes from some ignoramus, and he makes a statement. He says, Now you can just spend all your time going to Bible study and you don't do anything. What you need to do is to get out and get busy. Well, what you need to do is to get busy studying the Word of God. And when you do that, you'll get busy. I remember when we had our Bible study in downtown Los Angeles. 21 years, we averaged 1,500 people every Thursday night. What a thrill that was. What a privilege that was. And every now and then, I don't know whether somebody was being a little jealous or not, but they'd say, oh, just to go and sit and listen to the Bible, you need to do something. You need to sit and listen to the Bible, friend. And if you do that, you'll do something. And today, I happen to know that there are several hundred people that are on the mission field. And there are several hundred today that are witnessing for God, and several hundred in the ministry that attended those Thursday night meetings. And the interesting thing is, I noticed these boys who don't study the Word, they soon run down like an eight-day clock, and they don't last too long. We are told here, despise not prophesying, the teaching of the Word. Prove all things. Don't be taken in. And let me say this crude thing. Don't be a sucker today, friends. Just because somebody sends you a picture of some orphans, are some people way off yonder and you don't know anything about them, are some promotion job, investigate. I'd say to anybody that wants to support this program, investigators, come out here in California and visit us. Let us show you what we're doing. Prove all things. Christians ought not to just be gullible. Hold fast that which is good. My, how wonderful these things are that he mentions here. And I think this is the answer for a questionable pastime. Abstain. This is verse 22 now, the 19th. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's your answer. You question amusement. You say, is it right or wrong for me to do this? Abstain from all appearance of evil, friend. If there's any question in your mind, it must be wrong for you. Then verse 23 here. Man's a triune being. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That is, not perfectly, but we should reach a place of maturation. We ought not to continue to be babes in Christ. We should be growing. And therefore, sanctify you wholly, and I pray your whole spirit and soul and body 
be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we ought to mature. And faithful is he that call you also will do it. Now, the 20th commandment is in verse 25. Here, listen to it. Brethren, pray for us. The Lord has given you a commandment. You can't pray for Paul today, but you could pray for me, and I'd appreciate it. The 21st commandment, verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. That's a commandment, by the way, and make sure it's a holy kiss. Verse 27, that last one, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. And that's what I've done. I have attempted to read this entire epistle to you on the Through the Bible program. And now he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And I pray that that grace may be with each one of you, my beloved. Until next time, may God bless you.